Pat Robertson strikes again and mathematics and creation. This is the season finale of Genesis Week. Welcome to the season finale of Genesis Week, the weekly program of creationary commentary on news, views, and events pertaining to the origins controversy brought to you by the supporters of CORE Ottawa. Excellence in pirate broadcasting, Genesis Week is the show of choice for intellectuals who have an intelligently designed brain and know how to use it. Remember, if you get lost in cyberspace, you can just punch in wazulu.com, that's me, or genesisweek.com, that's the show, and you can find us and subscribe to our YouTube channel to get extras like Crevo rants and full interviews with our guests. I'm your host, Ian Juby. It seems more and more frequently that 700 Club's Pat Robertson makes outrageous, outlandish, and controversial remarks, putting Christians into damage control mode and distancing themselves from him. Well, this past week, in response to a viewer's question, he aimed his sights at the Young Earth creationists, saying... The, the truth is, uh, you have to be deaf, dumb, and blind to think that this Earth that we live in only has 6,000 years of existence. Deaf, dumb, and blind? Mr. Robertson, I believe you owe Young Earth creationists an apology, especially in light of what I am about to show. In an attempt to justify his comments, Mr. Robertson exposed his unfortunate, glaring ignorance on the age of the Earth and the scientific evidence by wading into the debate with misinformation and misunderstanding. For instance, he said... It just doesn't. I'm sorry. Uh, you know, I've got some interest in oil, and you're, you're now drilling in the Jurassic uh, uh, zone uh, 65 million years ago when those dinosaurs were here. They were, they were uh, rotting in the earth and making oil. And uh, there's no question about it. There's no question that there were dinosaurs and no question that radiocarbon dating, there were 65 million. Now, I don't mean to nitpick, but you did call Young Earth creationists deaf, dumb, and blind and then made a very long string of completely erroneous comments, such as drilling 65-million-year-old Jurassic deposits? Well, actually, that age would be Cretaceous, not Jurassic, and evidently Mr. Robertson is unaware of the continuing debate over the origin of oil, seeing as how oil can be found in lots of layers not associated with dinosaurs. Tell me, Mr. Robertson, how many dinosaurs have you dug up? I've excavated dinosaurs and dinosaur tracks all over North America. I assure you they do not come with the year they were made stamped on the bones. So how is it exactly that you know they are 65 million years old? Oh, what? What was that? Radiocarbon dating? Mr. Robertson, you cannot get an age any older than 100,000 years old with radiocarbon. It breaks down too quickly. Furthermore, yes, there has been dozens of radiocarbon tests conducted on dinosaur bones and wood fragments from dinosaur layers. They invariably return radiocarbon ages of between 5,000 to 50,000 years old, not 65 million years. Oh, and by the way, that oil you were talking about? Yeah, crude oil, alleged to be millions of years old, has also been radiocarbon dated and again returns ages of between 5,000 and 50,000 years old. On top of all that, we are finding more and more preserved soft tissues and blood cells in dinosaur remains. Tissues, cells, and evidently DNA that should not be there. In fact, the preservation of these tissues is on par with Egyptian and American mummies. Clearly, these dinosaur bones are not 65 million years old. Furthermore, no one... There is not a single young Earth creationist that I know of who doubts that dinosaurs existed. Certainly, I don't doubt it. I've excavated and prepped them for museums, and I'm a young Earth creationist. In fact, the name dinosaur was invented by a creationist, Sir Richard Owen. So how is it then that I, a young Earth creationist, am deaf, dumb, and blind? 
Or is it perhaps that the blind see something that you do not, the deaf heard something you never heard before, and the dumb are speaking of things which you are blissfully ignorant? Hmm? Mr. Robertson then forayed into more territory of which he is evidently ignorant. There's no question that some of the other things were much older than that, and we have so many geological records. You mean the geological records like the dinosaur beds, which were clearly laid down by a global flood? Contrary to what Mr. Robertson seems to think, when one looks at the actual scientific evidence, it is clear that it was not an asteroid that killed the dinosaurs. It was actually a big flood, exactly like the Bible said. Mr. Robertson, you should watch Crevo Rant number 17, Dinosaurs and Asteroids, where I explain in very simple terms and show the actual evidence of how we know what killed the dinosaurs. And that geological record? Did I mention that no matter where we take samples from it, we get young radiocarbon ages? Coal, CO2 wells, fossil wood, etc. I also challenge you to find me any place on planet Earth where the geologists do not say, this place where we stand was once underneath an ancient ocean. Find me such a place. For, for crying out loud, even Mount Everest is covered in fossil sea life. But you didn't know this, did you? See, it's clear that the geological record was primarily laid down by a flood of global proportions. But the crux of this whole matter comes to a head when Mr. Robertson attempts to stuff billions of years into the Bible by trying to redefine how long the days of creation were. Well, what about a uh, galactic day? That could be how long it takes a galaxy to transverse the universe. And so now you're talking about billions of years. You don't know how long it is. So day one, day two, and day three, uh, it's all accommodated if you look at it that way. I, I think what we're looking at is that there was a point of time after the earth was created, after these things were done, after the universe was formed, after the uh, asteroid hit the earth and wiped out the dinosaurs, after all that, there was a point of time that there's a particular human being that God touched. And that was the human that started the race that we are now part of. And I think prior to that, who knows what was here. Well, actually, Mr. Robertson, we know exactly how long the six days of creation were by the context of the Bible. Each of the days of creation are associated with a number, day one, two, three, etc. Each day is associated with light and darkness. Each day included an evening and a morning. Right there, it cannot be any clearer that these were literal 24-hour days. Secondly, if you want to say that those days represent, say, millions or billions of years, you've got a serious math problem. Because Adam was created on day 6, lived through day 7, and died sometime after that at 930 years old. Not 930 million years old. Furthermore, while we creationists, and I presume Pastor Robertson, both consider the Holy Bible to be the inspired Word of God, there is one part of that Bible that I would contend was not inspired. The Ten Commandments. They were not written by inspiration through men, but were written by the very finger of God himself. One of those commandments refers to creation week. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested on the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Obviously, Mr. Robertson, I do not want to work for, say, six million years before I can take my million-year day off. <laughs> it is very clear the days of creation were literal days. But here is where you will say ouch or amen. You see, Mr. Robertson, you spoke out of ignorance insulting young earth creationists over a subject matter you very clearly know absolutely nothing about. But you were also referring to Jesus Christ as deaf, dumb, and blind. Why? Because Jesus Christ was a young earth creationist. Have you not read the scriptures where Jesus was asked about divorce? He replied, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning? made them male and female, and said, 
For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. To Jesus, Adam was a literal person. In the beginning. Not millions of years after the dinosaurs. Are you now going to redefine the meaning of in the beginning? Adam was not some metaphorical figure here either. In fact, Jesus was quoting Adam and what he said when his wife Eve was brought to him. Jesus only spoke of the Genesis account of creation as literal history, at a time when there were forms of evolutionary theory and belief already among the Greeks. If evolution were true, do you not think Jesus would have instead pointed to the Greek beliefs? instead of Genesis? Jesus was the one who rose from the dead, so you'll please understand why I believe him and not you. But then Mr. Robertson closed with a most incredible statement. But I think to deny the clear record that's there before us makes us look silly. And you got the old earth, new earth. There's no way that all this that you have here took place in 6,000 years. It just couldn't have been done couldn't possibly have been done. Really? Well, Jesus rose from the dead in three days. Do you believe that, Mr. Robertson? Well, of course you do. Well, what about the miracles Jesus did? Did they require millions of years? Of course not. So why is it that raising the dead, which, scientifically speaking, is just as impossible as making a man from the dust of the earth, why is it that raising the dead like Lazarus took seconds, Yet you claim that it is impossible for all of this to be 6,000 years old. Mr. Robertson raising the dead is impossible. What is impossible to man is really quite irrelevant to God now, isn't it? I've had many people ask, and I apologize it's taken this long to sort out. Many people had asked how they could donate to Core Ottawa Online and get a Canadian tax receipt. You can now do that at the same donation page as previously. Just look for the Donate button, and if your address is not already entered in PayPal, uh, please be sure to include your name and address in the box that pops up for additional information when you make a donation. Thank you to all of you for your support, and please pray for the show and myself as we sort out the future. I am considering putting together a children's creation science show but production is completely different than Genesis Week. Many viewers wrote in with an unusual request. Could we touch on the immaterial on the show, things like math? Evolution is a myth tweeted. Thoughts on doing a show about immaterial stuff like laws of logic math. Kevin Lane also tweeted, I would very much like to see how logic and math are more than just descriptions of a physical reality. And Nunya Beeswax followed up afterwards with another tweet. Excellent work. When is your episode coming about immaterial things that couldn't possibly have evolved? Do Darwinists think that Pythagorean's theorem evolved from the number 4 and 4 from 3? As some would argue, the principle here being that you cannot describe immaterial things like mathematics, which obviously exist, Therefore, you cannot argue against the existence of a creator God with material science. For example, what could science possibly say about love? We all know it exists, yet scientifically speaking, love can hardly be called observable. And it certainly isn't repeatable, nor is it predictable. <laughs> it is the same argument with whether or not a creator God exists. Now, I would contend, however, that the science that verifies our creator's existence is observable, repeatable, and predictable, and that is what this show is devoted to. Now, one of the ways this is seen is by using the immaterial, like mathematics, to interpret the material world scientifically. But how is this done? To bring us great joy, I am joined by mathematician Ellen Montgomery. Ellen has a degree in mathematics and has worked in the field of actuarial mathematics, which is used in mortality studies for insurance companies and pension plans. Hello, Ellen. Hello, Ian. What's the probability you're alive today? I'll answer that after I drink my coffee. In Crevo Rant number 107 and on multiple episodes of Genesis Week, I discussed Miller's experiments in The Origin of Life. Uh, his purpose was to create amino acids that are essential for life. Yes, the scientists have focused on chemicals rather than the organization of 
chemicals. That's because that's part of their mission, and the easiest part of their mission is to focus on, you know, actually making the, the, the chemistry. But that doesn't get them out of the sandbox. You know, they're still playing around. The hard part is ordering the chemicals that they make into sequences that actually produce life. Life is not in the chemicals. Life is in the organization of the chemicals and information and function. This is not on the chemicals, but it's on the order of the chemicals. If I had a license plate, right, you could perhaps design an experiment that would produce the raw metal from, say, ore and lightning, but the metal doesn't tell the policeman if I own the car. It's the sequence of the numbers on the plate that tells the policeman that I own the car or somebody else does and I stole it, right? Or if you make a distress call using, you know, a telegraph, you send dot, 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 dash, 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 dot, 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 and everybody knows the SOS code for Morse code and knows that you're in trouble. But does it really matter whether you use you know, a telegraph key or a telephone or a radio to communicate, I'm in distress, or SOS. The way you transmit the information isn't really the, the, the problem. It's the code that you use to transmit that. You cannot invent Morse code randomly. You have to know it, use it, and, and, and decode it. So your DNA is storing information in the order of the chemicals that are in the cell. This is why you call it a code. It's not, the, the, it's not that the chemicals are irrelevant, uh, they're de- but they're just like dead matter in the, in the process. You are s- to solve the origin of chemicals does not solve the problem of the origin of life. So another illustration w- would be taking an egg, beating it up in a bowl, putting it in a jar and sealing it off so it, there's no bacteria and waiting for it to produce life. Well, it's not going to produce life because you've destroyed the order. But you have all the chemistry there. So where does the math come in? Well, if a protein is intelligently sequenced, we can ask uh, what is the probability of getting this sequence randomly? Well, you know, you, you know, this first assumes that God is not the one that is sequencing these uh, amino acids into proteins. So you, you're basically starting off with a pro, with a, an assumption of unbelief, right? So that that's that's one problem. You're you're not really doing science openly. You're doing science with a presupposition that God doesn't exist. So the scientists have been trying to claim that you can order these things randomly without any intelligent input. And of course, if a scientist uses his university learning and his God-given intelligence to create life, that would not count as random. Unless, of course, he was a complete idiot. And he would have to prove he was an idiot. Oh, yeah, and that might take intelligence as well. Hmm. Yes. So, they insist that if you produce enough proteins, by some great protein factory over a very long period of time, sooner or later, a usable life-giving protein will just happen. You know, monkeys typing on typewriters until the word appears uh, randomly. Well, we can calculate this probability. I mean, this is is something the subject to mathematical probability theory, right? So let's try looking at a very, very simple protein called proinsulin. It's very, very short. It's only 84 amino acids long. So you've got a big chain of 84 amino acids, and that's a protein. Its protein, its position can be filled at each one of those 84 spots by one of 20 different life-giving amino acids. That means that you have 10 to the power 84 possibilities. Or if you don't like thinking in base 20, it's 10 to the power 106. Uh, that's a very big number, and uh, we'll need to we'll get chop that down a bit a little later 
when we talk about uh, how long this is. Dr. Eden estimates that in the entire Earth's history, all the life on Earth has produced about 10 to the 52 proteins, assuming that they're all different and assuming that they're all 84 units long, we can then say that we can now divide the 10 to the 52 into 10 to the 106 and we say there's only one probability in 10 to the power 54 that one of these is pro -insulin. So that's one chance in a million, trillion, 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 trillion. Because you're starting with 20 in each slot, you've got 400 slots, that's 20 to the power 400. And if you put that back to base 10, that's 10 to the power 520. Not, you know, that's nowhere near 10 to the power 74. So you end up with, that's that's just on, on the face of it, one chance in 10 to the power 446. You could produce the proteins, the one protein that we're, we're looking at. And of course, such a number is like, just, you know, out of this universe. It's not even out of this world, it's out of this universe. Okay, so if, if we cut this down a bit, sort of allow a certain number of substitutions along the chain, like, I mean, some proteins, you change one amino acid and the protein's useless and you die. But, but let's just, you know, cut the odds down a bit and let's say, you know, once every hundred proteins, you can do one substitution, right? We can then bring the odds down to ten, one in 10 to the power 171. So that's a pretty big number. How do we comprehend such big numbers? Well, imagine you've got like a little single celled animal like an amoeba, and it's going to carry one atom on the face of this earth uh, somehow right out to the radius of the edge of the universe and back at the rate of one inch every year. <laughs> And after that amount of time has gone by, we're nowhere near close to getting to an, an amino, a, a protein, which would be life-giving. So when the scientists talk about this and they're, and they're Darwinists and they don't want to admit God, what they do is they wave their hands around and say, given enough time. Well, you know, 15 billion years isn't even a drop on a drop on a drop in the bucket of what you need. So by just waving their hands and saying, given enough time, they are avoiding the problem. But yet, I already know what the skeptics will say. It's a remote chance, but it's not a zero chance. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I would talk to a university student who, you know, we were taking a course in geology, and he sort of said the same thing to me, uh, that, you know, we just seen a lecture and, and you know, Evolution is a fact. And so I gave him a little 10-minute speech on the probabilities of getting life from non-life, and he came back with the same answer, yes, the chance is not zero. You, you haven't proven it's actually impossible. So I asked him, yeah, well, what if somebody rose from the dead and told you it was impossible? And he didn't quite understand that because, uh, you know, but it stopped and made him think which is interesting uh, that you use that analogy because that is exactly what we're talking about life from non-life it's it's the exact same thing as if someone rose from the dead it's life from non-life well yes yeah but when would somebody be able to win the lottery 165 weeks in a row without the police setting up a fraud investigation after maybe three weeks you know these people are basically saying that no matter how the small how small the probability, I can believe there is no God. But that's what they started out with. If you set, you know, you can't do science and say I know the outcome before I do the experiment. That's not science. What you have is a belief system that won't let science tell you anything but what you've decided to believe beforehand. And if somebody won the lottery 165 weeks in a row, nobody would say it was an accident. No, there's no accident in in winning the lottery 165 times in a row. Somebody's fixing the system, and the police are going to investigate that. 
All right. Thank you for taking the time for the viewers and for myself for being on the show today. Well, thank you for calling me in. Stick around. We'll be back in one minute. To the horror of both fans and enemies, Ian Juby is back with more ranting goodness. Okay, Jacques. You first. Just when you thought his meds had kicked in, Ian goes off on a tangent about what killed the dinosaurs. The origin of life, defining evolution, and yes, even sex. It wasn't enough for an R rating, but nowadays, what is? Volume 4 of his ever-popular and ever-hated Karevo Rants has eight new short, fast, funny, and hard-hitting episodes. You can get your copy on the soon-to-be-extinct DVD for 15 bucks plus shipping and handling, or purchase the instant digital download of all eight tracks for just eight bucks. Or you can buy all four volumes of his world-infamous rants for the price of three. Order your copies today and have a party with, like, popcorn and stuff. Visit Ian's bookstore today. Woohoo! Mail for me? In response to our interview with Dr. Jeffrey Tompkins, several people wrote in pointing out a mistake like, Since when did humans have 48 chromosomes and apes have 46? That was a simple slip-up. It happens when you're having television and radio interviews. Uh, as Tompkins correctly stated previously, humans have 46, apes have 48. Following the discussion of space and time dilation, Jungle Jargon wrote in and was picked as Tyler's TikTok quote of the week. There is no such thing as a light year because neither time nor space is measurable because they are entirely relative. Light taking time to arrive proves there was an expansion of time because light arrives instantly and we see it take time because time expanded from no time. The same is true for space that also expanded from no space. There is much less time and less space in much of the universe and we cannot use our rate of time or measure of distance to measure things in space because both time and space are entirely relative. We see expanded space and there is little or no space in a black hole, and there is little or no passing of time there. So we cannot use expanded time as a measure of time because the time we see expanded from no time so that the time we see is closer to no time than it is to billions of years. <laughs> Thanks for writing in. Okay, we are way out of time, so I'm your host, Ian Juby, signing off for the summer. We will continue to run past episodes over the summer at the same bat time and same bat channel. Let me close off this season with that final reminder of those words of our Creator, the Lord Jesus Christ, who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Bye for now. We are a viewer-supported program and need your support to keep this program on the air. Please pray for us, and if you wish to financially support the program, Canadians can make a tax-deductible donation to CORE Ottawa, Canada North Post Office Box 72075, Ottawa, Ontario, K2K 2P4. While we cannot offer tax-deductible receipts outside of Canada, donors wishing to financially support the program can do so online at ianjuby.org slash donations, and thank you for your support.